Welcome to episode 153 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to Special Agent Serena Coughlin, who has been with the FBI for more than 18 years. She is currently the employment recruiter for the Philadelphia Field Office. She is also the local coordinator for InfraGuard, a public-private partnership between the FBI and representatives of critical infrastructure. Special Agent Serena Coughlin was a member of the Los Angeles Innocent Images Safe Team, where she investigated cases involving the sexual exploitation of children. She's also been assigned to counterterrorism squads in the Los Angeles and Baltimore divisions. Here in the Philadelphia division, before she was assigned as the FBI recruiter, she was on a squad that investigated cybercrime. Special Agent Serena Coughlin is married to another FBI agent, and they have three children. This is FBI Retired Case File Review's second special recruiting episode. In episode 41, we went over the application process. I know that this is a mega episode, but even if you have no plans to join the FBI one day, I believe you'll find this episode fascinating. We cover all aspects of what it's like to be a special agent from the salary, transfers and work assignments, firearm policies, fitness requirements, and more. If you're curious about who the FBI is and what the FBI does, this episode is for you. During the episode, we chat about FBI cliches on TV shows and movies. So I want to remind you about my FBI reality checklist of 20 misconceptions about the FBI found in books, TV, and movies, and invite you to join my reader team to get your copy. You'll also get access to my FBI reading resource, books about the FBI written by the very FBI agents who have appeared on this podcast. My FBI reading resource currently has more than 45 books, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. And once a month, I'll also keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. You can join my reader team at jerrywilliams.com or by clicking the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. And one last thing, it's February and I'm celebrating Black History Month by inviting you to listen to or re-listen to episode 14 with retired special agent in charge, Wayne Davis, one of the first fully qualified African-American agents allowed to attend the FBI Academy. His recounting of his one-on-one meeting with Director Hoover is amazing. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Special Agent Serena Coughlin. Good morning. I'm very excited to be here. Before I go one minute further, or one second further, I want to give a shout out to special agent in charge, Mike Harpster, for allowing you to come on the show today and bring us up to date on recruiting and questions that everyone has about applying for the special agent position. So thank you, SAC Harpster. Thank you, Mr. Harpster. So the last time we talked about special agent recruiting, again, courtesy of SAC Harpster, I had Greg Branch, who was the uh, applicant coordinator recruiter for the Philadelphia division, who is now retired. And I'm going to get him on real soon to talk about one of his FBI cases. We had him and then we had a new agent at the time, Bill Tolan. And that was episode 41. And during that episode, we went through the qualifications, you know, what you needed to, to bring to the table as a special agent candidate. And we also went through the phases of the application process. So have you had a chance to listen to episode 41? I did. Yes. It was very entertaining, very, very informative. Is there anything that we mentioned during that episode that's changed now that uh, you need to update us on? 
The primary thing is a very new change, and it just occurred at the end of October. And that has to do with the qualifications for coming in uh, as an agent for being a, a viable candidate for the position. And that is in the professional work experience. So for at least in, in my memory, the 18 years that I've been in the FBI, it was always three years professional work experience with an undergraduate degree and two years with a graduate degree. And that has changed. So it is now two years professional work experience with an undergraduate and one year professional work experience that is minimally uh, expected with a graduate degree. Well, that's pretty interesting. I think we have a question coming up that uh, we can expand on that a little bit. So, because yes. I have some, I, I, that generated some questions for me too. That change is significant. So, other than that, instead of looking at some of those basic questions, what I was able to do was to put a call out to listeners of FBI Retired Case File Review, and I asked them to send me in their questions. And I think you'd agree, they're, they're pretty good. Oh, they're fantastic. The, the quality of the questions was amazing. And also the, the depth of the questions, you can tell that people have really been doing their research. Yes. I, I was uh, I was really pleased with that. As a matter of fact, I mentioned that I was going to be doing this episode only a few times because the questions poured in, and uh, many of the people who sent in questions sent in more than one. And so by the time I got to around 30, I just kind of stopped asking <laughs> four questions because I figured <laughs> if we spent an average of two you know, to three minutes on each of these, then we would have a full hour episode. So uh, the, the lucky few were able to get in. And, you know, if after this goes out, I get a, um, a rush of uh, emails from people who wish they had had the opportunity to submit a question, maybe we'll do this again. I would be there uh, with bells on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So I think that uh, the best thing for us to do is to, to get started here. My first question was sent in by April, and she wanted to talk about the policies concerning tattoos, if that hinders you from becoming an FBI agent. Okay, it's funny because this is one of the top questions that I get asked all the time as a recruiter. Oh, really? Um, so I, I have a, a very good set answer for this one. And it's funny because I actually work with people that have full sleeves. So a tattoo in the FBI is not unusual. It's not unique. There are lots of agents with tattoos, but uh, like any professional position, the, the placement needs to be taken into consideration. You have to be able to cover them up, beginning with your time at Quantico when you're there for training. So if you have visible tattoos, they need to be covered by clothing during your training. And uh, you should be very considerate of the fact that you represent the FBI to the public. So the subject matter of the tattoo is important. Once you come into the Bureau, every employee represents us as, as a group, as a whole. Uh, Director Comey used to say there's a repository of trust that was built by generations that came before us, and it's incumbent upon each employee to add to that well in a positive way, not break down the good that came before us. So I, I know I'm off the subject of, of tattoos, but I think it's important to establish right away that FBI employees we're held to a standard that's set by the public's trust in us. So it depends on the subject matter of the tattoo, and you have to be able to cover it up because there will be situations that you need to be um, in a more conservative light. So tattoos are good. We've got them in the FBI. You just have to be able to cover them up. The mother of a son who has the whole body art. So yeah. it's good to know that he's that he still has uh, an opportunity. Not that he's interested in <laughs> one iota and becoming <laughs> an agent. He, he won't be following in his mother's uh, uh, footsteps. All yeah. right. So our, our next question is, all, uh, these are three that uh, April sent in. So her second question is that she knows that you have to have a bachelor's degree, but are there any specific fields that you suggest somebody applying for the FBI major in? 
This is probably the question that when I read this, I was so excited that somebody asked this because it really does set the stage for me to discuss most of what I want to make sure your listeners hear about coming into the FBI because you and I had this conversation the other day. It's There are so many misconceptions about who comes into the Bureau and who we hire. So this is a perfect question to address that. I say all the time with recruitment, I never need to worry about generating interest in the FBI. It's getting that interest to translate into an application. So everybody wants to know about the Bureau, what we do, who we are. Uh, When I go to career fairs, we're always the table that has the crowd around it because people are so curious about the FBI. And when I introduce myself to people and they find out what I do, I'm very often the the first FBI agent they've ever met. And the reaction I usually get is, really? You're you're not what I expected. Or "I, I never would have thought that you were an agent. And I'm never insulted by that because it makes a great point that there is no standard FBI agent. We come in all shapes, sizes, genders, tall, short, dark skin, light, every shade in between, every cultural, religious background, and every area of expertise. So many people think that the FBI is only made up of former cops and military, and that could not be further from the truth. So a- another huge myth that, I, myth that I'm always busting is that we're all agents. So there are only 13,000 FBI agents in the entire world, and that is a shockingly small figure if you think about it, especially considering the impact we have and the responsibilities and, of course, the popular media presence. But with 13,000 special agents, there are more than 35,000 FBI employees. We have more than 800 job roles in the Bureau. And I say all the time, if there's a job that exists outside of the FBI, we can find its equivalent within. And that means we need to have every degree, so every subject matter expertise represented. FBI agents are are like the tip of the spear when it comes to procuring information. So we're the ones going out into communities, talking to people, conducting interviews, gathering knowledge, which means that we need to have all types of experts as FBI agents. So something that I'm always battling is that people think they need to follow this very narrow path when they come into the FBI. And we actively recruit everyone, teachers, nurses, lawyers, social workers, psychologists, architects. We need people with hard science and STEM skills. We need art historians and people with backgrounds in the humanities. So I I think our biggest strength is in the diversity of our workforce in, in every way, including every type of knowledge, degrees, and expertise. So I I know that's a really long answer, but it's kind of hitting all the information I wanted to get out there. And I also just want to bring up, we have these elements, traits that we call core competencies. So it's things like leadership and communication skills, being flexible and adaptable. This is what we look at more than anything else. And it's why so many different professional careers are a great preparation for becoming an FBI agent. So the number one resource that I want everybody to utilize is our website, which is fbijobs.gov. And that's where you can get additional information about the qualifications. And it's also where you go to look for current openings and to hopefully apply for a job with the FBI. And I will put a link to fbijobs.gov with this episode so that uh, they can click right on it and and take them right to the page that they need to be on. And that's different than FBI.gov, which is the main website. Exactly. Okay. All right. The next question, we both are going to enjoy this one. (laughs) And April's question is, I have three children and I wonder how being an agent would affect them and their lives. Um, Congratulations. Uh, me too. <laughs> and me too. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is another one of the biggest misconceptions that you can't be an FBI agent and have a family life. And that could not be further from the truth. I'm married to another agent and we have three young kids. We have three boys. And uh, Jerry, you and I were joking at the beginning of this recording that you might hear one of my children because it's a snow day today. And FBI agents are just like every other parent. And we have to deal with things like snow days and our children being off from school. (laughs) But but the, the sad thing is, I think this is one of the reasons that so many women in particular 
don't consider the FBI as a potential employer. So you would think in, in 2019, we would have equal parenting roles, but the truth is women are still the primary caregivers in this country. Um, and so many women think that they can't be both an agent and, and a mom. And I've had 100% support from every supervisor I ever had when it came to Family First. So my husband coaches our children's sports teams. I, I don't miss our children's events, concerts, and plays. I was able to take long-term maternity leave with each of my children up to six months. And I have found it is a fantastic job for a mom or a dad to have. And there's that coolness factor for your kids. Before I became involved in recruitment, I didn't necessarily advertise what I do. But now my children can tell their friends. And it's a very cool job to grade schoolers. I have three children too. And like you, well, for my, my son, I was so into the job that I did not take the adequate time off that I should have, that, that, I, that I was due. But when uh, my twin girls came along, I took six months off too. So it definitely is a position of, you know, flexible job where you can still be a mother and a special agent. Uh, there, Yeah, there are times, of course, uh, when you need to have that support behind you when you do have to get up early in the morning or, or work on a weekend unexpectedly, but that can happen in the corporate world too. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing I think, especially looking at the highly competitive private sector, there are lots of times that when I tell people I was able to take six months maternity leave, their jaw drops because that's just not the norm in a lot of uh, the private world. Well, I hope that really helps April in her desire to become an agent and to get that application in. Me too. All right. Next question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two questions at the same time okay. because Robert asked a question and Carrie asked a question that are kind of related. So Robert asks, what the heck is an analyst? <laughs> what kind of work do they do and how are they hired and trained? And Carrie's question is that she wants to be an intelligence analyst and that she has been applying to the FBI for the last couple of years, but she has no success. And she wanted to know if you have any general insights or thoughts or pointers that you could share that will help her revamp her resume or that might give her some insight into what the FBI is looking for when it looks at the application for intelligence analyst. Sure. So an intelligence analyst is someone who looks at information or intelligence from a variety of sources, and they try to put it into a cohesive picture that then we can draw actionable information from. So in the field, they'll work side by side with agents and other professional support as a very vital member of the investigative team. Our analysts are worth their weight in gold because there really are not very many of them. And the skills that they bring to the team are invaluable. So they're hired through the same type of recruitment efforts that we use for agents because the qualities of an ideal analyst can be very similar to what we look for in a special agent. So those core competencies that I mentioned we really stress those for just about every position that the FBI has open. Things like leadership and communication and initiative. It is a great job for someone who loves what a special agent does, but they don't necessarily want the law enforcement side of the job, or they can't fulfill the physical requirements of agent. Um, we have lots of former military members who have made ideal analysts, and uh, many of them came to us through the Wounded Warriors program. So that is a great job opportunity for them. And then in terms of tips, what I would suggest is that you contact your recruiter so that they can look at your resume and see what it might be lacking. So often, people don't reach out to their recruiter until after they've put in their application. And I think everybody would benefit from beginning a dialogue with a recruiter before they put in their application. Because it could just be the way that she's writing it up and it's not highlighting the qualifications that we're looking for. And it doesn't mean that she's lacking them. It's just the way that it's being written up. So that the skill sets that benefit analysts are 
exactly the same as those core competencies for agents. And we need to look for professional experience that you had that translates into the FBI. So if the positions that you've held before don't look like they would allow you to develop the expertise that we're looking for, you may just need to do a better job of explaining how they would apply. So each case is going to be different and you're better off developing a relationship with your recruiter so that they can help you determine if it's actually something that you're lacking or if it's just something that isn't being written up. The analyst position grew right after 9-11. So I'm learning a lot more about the increased responsibilities of the analyst position myself. Yeah, our our analysts, like I said, they are worth their weight in platinum. (laughs) (laughs) Well, excellent. Next is a series of questions from Robert. And I have to say, hi, Robert. Robert and I have gotten to be friends. He's deep into the application process. And um, I'm, I just can't wait till he calls me to, to let me know that he's on his way to, to Quantico. So I'm, <laughs> I'm excited for him. And some of these questions I know he already knows the answers to, but uh, he's always a good sport and always supports me in this podcast. And so he, he sent in some great ones. And, and the first one is always funny. And we always get this one. Why are FBI agents all special agents? Are there agents who aren't special? And what is the hierarchy of the special agents within the Bureau? First, I'll skip all of the jokes about how we're all special because uh, <laughs> I, I, I get those jokes a lot. Yeah. Um, but actually, when I first did research about this, because I had, oh gosh, probably years ago, I think a high school student asked me that question. I didn't know the answer. So I, I did do research on this and I have had it come up several times since then. But when we use the term agent in the FBI, it refers to special agent. So there is no just agent in the Bureau. If you're an agent, you're a special agent. So in terms of just the pure phrase in the government, an agent is a law enforcement officer with arrest authority, but they don't conduct investigations or they can conduct investigations, but they don't have arrest authority. So a special agent can do both. And that, I think, was from 1908 that was first established uh, because they wanted to make sure that within the FBI, we had that full, broad range of authority. And then in terms of hierarchy, that varies a lot, whether you're talking about the field or at headquarters, because at headquarters, the titles are completely different. And not everyone who holds a position of authority, particularly at headquarters, is or was an agent. So, for example, with only two exceptions, the directors of the FBI were never FBI agents. Clarence Kelly and Louis Free were our only directors that were FBI agents. And then in the field, special agents can become management. Typically, they begin as supervisory special agents, which is a totally different job role than a special agent. So you are the person who manages a squad. Uh, what it's responsible for, what headquarters requires, and you answer to an assistant special agent in charge as a supervisory special agent or an SSA. And the assistant special agent in charge, we call them ASACs, they're generally responsible for managing a group of squads. They're typically all related to particular violations like all of the cyber squads or all of the counterterrorism squads. And then there is the special agent in charge of a field office. So New York, our Washington field office, and LA have several SACs because their top agent is actually an assistant director in charge. And then when you get to headquarters, that is a completely different beast and a totally different structure. But for the most part in the field, it would go special agent, supervisory special agent, assistant special agent in charge special agent in charge, and then with the other three offices, an assistant director in charge. I like to stress that one aspect of the FBI, uh, you know, is that chain of command, um, and, and that we really respect that going to your supervisor before you go to your ASAC or before Absolutely. you go to the special agent in charge. But it is not like the military, and, and, and many times you're on first name basis with uh, all of those people, which is great. And and you barbecue with them, and they're children uh, know your children. And yeah, we're, we're a big family here. 
Good. All right, Robert's next question. When are FBI agents required to carry their firearms? When can they lock it up? So basically what he wants to know is, are you expected to carry it to the family holiday gathering or when you go out to a bar with your friends? You know, what is the protocol? And if you don't have to carry it with you at all times, where do you put it? Right. So the very first thing I thought of when I read this question, of course, was the dreaded airport bathroom uh, scenario. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get you get creative <laughs> as an agent when it comes to safely handling your firearm in sticky situations. We carry a firearm while we are on duty. It's part of the requirement of being an agent. And then it's up to the individual agent when and if they want to carry it while they're not working. But technically, we're on duty 24 hours a day. But there are obviously situations that good judgment would call for it to be securely stored, like when you're going out to a bar or you're going to be engaging in some kind of physical activity that it wouldn't be safe to be armed, or if you're going to the gym or, or the pool. And that's when you, you get creative. So we have very specific and strict guidelines for handling your firearm in a safe manner and how you store it. And some of those I can't really discuss, but we do have the capability of safely storing our firearm in just about every situation. We receive equipment that they provide us to make sure that our firearm is safely stored. So if you're going to the gym, if you're going to the pool, you would be able to do that. And I've known agents who will literally wear a gun to walk down to get the mail at the end of the driveway. I've known people who, particularly with a lot of the concerns with many of the active shooter situations that we've had that would never dream of going to a house of worship or to a movie theater without being armed. But it's really up to the individual agent. You are required while you're on duty to carry. And then the rest of it really is a judgment call. All right, Robert, next question. FBI agents pay is based on the general schedule, GS schedule. What grade does an agent start at? And at what point would an agent be promoted up a grade? So basically, he wants to know that the steps of moving through the promotional levels. Sure. So I mentioned fbijobs.gov, but the other website that is invaluable to somebody who wants to learn about any government position is opm.gov, where it lays out everything about the GS scale. So agents without prior prior government service, they start out as a GL-10, step one, with a Washington, D.C. locality pay. So this is at Quantico, plus 25% of their basic pay, which is uh, their pay plus locality. So that sounds a little bit complicated, but depending on what office you are located at, you're going to receive a different locality percentage because obviously some places have a higher cost of living than others. So for example, in New York is going to have a higher percentage for locality pay than New Orleans. We don't make overtime as agents and that availability pay, that 25% that I mentioned, that is for being available at all times and for working an average of 50 hours per week. So as an agent, you get your base, your locality pay, and then 25% of that, which is called AVP. And then when you graduate from Quantico, you start out as a GL-10 with the field office that you're assigned to their locality pay plus AVP. And then most agents achieve a GS-13, around their fifth year. And then you stay at GS-13 for the rest of your career, moving up steps. So GS-13, step three, GS-13, step seven, unless you go into management, in which case you go to a GS-14 or a 15. And then the step increases, they're periodic, they're not annual, but they do depend on the time you have in and they generally occur around your entry anniversary. So the best resource for looking information up about the GS scale is opm.gov. But what I can say is by the time you retire, most agents are making around 150000 annually. 
And then you have some fantastic retirement benefits, which can begin as early as age 50. That I think is one of the biggest perks of being an FBI agent that often doesn't get brought up, that you are eligible to retire after 20 years of service at age 50, which is pretty amazing. And you can retire with full benefits. Yeah, I know I took advantage of that. I think that's a question that I I, I got that made me chuckle. And it was from a listener who sent me an email wanting to know why all of the retired agents that I spoke to had post FBI jobs? Was it because the pension was so low? And <laughs> I had to let her know the pension's pretty good. And and again, you, you can start earning that as soon as you retire, even if you retire at age 50. But I explained to her it's because, you know, we were only 50. And right. that, um, you know, with a lot more to give back to the community after having, you know, gained so much skills and experience with the FBI, and that it was a matter of being indoctrinated into the FBI culture of wanting to work and, and needing to, to have that adre- adrenaline rush of contributing. There is no non-type A personality that's an agent that I've come across, at least in my career. Everybody tends to be very much a go-getter, and they're not really the type that would do well on the golf course every day. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. That's fun. But can you give us a starting range for everybody who's going to be at Quantico receiving their pay? When they first get in and they're at the FBI Academy and they're receiving their uh, special agent pay, oh, wait a minute, though, because they wouldn't be getting the 25% availability pay. Well, you you know what's funny? They do, actually. And I was under the impression that they did not because I didn't get it. But now apparently they do. Oh, wow. All right. So so what is that that beginning salary at the beginning of their career? Say everybody who's at Quantico, at the FBI Academy, uh, they're all at the same location. What would be the starting salary for them? So you would start off as a GL10 step one which for Washington, D.C. locality is around $62,000. And then once you can figure in that 25% AVP, you're talking around seventy-two, seventy-three thousand $73,000. Oh, I think that's pretty good. It, it is pretty good. And that really is just at the very beginning because you do go up in the GS scale fairly quickly. So I said that it would be a GS-13 by year five, but you go up between the GS-10 and the GS-13, there are several spaces in between there, and you go up that pretty quickly. And staying at Quantico, I... uh Robert had a question about that, too. Sure. He said, if you are married and becoming a special agent, how would you maintain your relationship with your family while you're at the FBI Academy? 21 weeks would be a very long time not to see his spouse and and his daughter. Right. So 21 weeks is a very long time. Um, And we do recommend that new agent trainees, that they don't come home on the weekends too often because you really are very busy for those 21 weeks. And your first few weeks, you are actually required to stay at Quantico on the weekend. That's not saying that you can't see people several times during your training. They can come out and visit. You can go home, particularly if you reside anywhere near Virginia. And unlike when I went through, technology allows you to video chat and keep in touch. So you can Skype, you can FaceTime people, and it is, it's hard. And every person has to decide whether this type of career is worth five months of training and being away from your family. But we lose very, very few agents through means other than retirement. The phrase, it's not a job, it's a career is not accurate for FBI agents. I always say it isn't a career, it's a calling. And if you really believe that, then... It doesn't make the difficult sacrifices any easier, but they're in context because you realize that your sacrifice is, I don't want to use the phrase worth it, but you realize that you are contributing to something that's so critical and so important that your sacrifice has meaning. Hmm. 
Now, I know when I was at the FBI Academy, and this is probably true for, for people in your class, that they did move their families to Quantico, Virginia. That had to be extremely stressful for them. Yes. Yes. And it's actually discouraged for people to do that because it's difficult for the new agent trainee who really needs to focus on what they're doing to have any extraneous distractions. And most of us are not independently wealthy and we can't just move our family into a temporary location for a period of time. But there are weekends and now with the um, advent of technology, you are able to keep in touch with people through other means in ways that you couldn't just 10, 15 years ago. So it's not forbidden, but definitely not recommended. Correct. Exactly. And in your first few weeks, you do need to remain at Quantico on the weekends. All right. Robert's next question is that he has heard of retaliatory violence uh, against prosecutors. He wants to know if that is something that FBI agents have to reckon with. And if so, how is it handled? So threats to agent safety, that's extremely rare. And it actually is to federal prosecutors as well. So he might be thinking more of local prosecutors. But FBI agents, we have a reputation for being very fair and honest with the subjects of our cases. And it is not unheard of for someone who's been sent to prison to contact their arresting agent when they have information or they have a concern because of that rapport and that level of trust that's been built. So it's much more likely that they'll view an agent with respect as opposed to someone that should be retaliated against. Um, So this generally isn't something that we've had to worry about in the Bureau, but we do take threats on an agent or their family extremely seriously. And we have had situations that agents and their families have been sequestered following an incident of violence or threatened violence. So I can think of a situation several years ago when I was an agent in LA that um, one of our agents was attacked walking into his apartment, and it had nothing to do with him being an agent, but he was actually removing his weapons from the trunk at the time that he was attacked. It was part of a gang that had attacked him, and there were some concerns whether that was related to his work, but it was not at all. Meanwhile, the FBI, because we do take those threats so seriously, he and his family were completely sequestered for a period of time until the investigation was over to make sure that this wasn't related to his job. Okay. Robert's next question. And Robert sent in a, <laughs> a good number of questions. But <laughs> I can next, meet Robert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. He's a, he's a great guy. He doesn't even live in this area, but I was traveling and he heard I was in town and, and we got together for lunch. So that, oh, great. Yeah, yeah. So his next question is about collateral duties, such as SWAT or being on a tech team, he says, or ERT. Can you talk about how a special agent gets to be on some of those collateral positions? Sure. So it's funny because, Jerry, you immediately fell into the Bureau language instead of ancillary duty. As Robert put it, you immediately said collateral because that is what we call them. So we call them collateral duties, and each one varies in how you become a part of that team. So most involve some sort of tryout or at least an interview with the team members, the team leaders to see if it's a good fit. And of course, you have to get your supervisor's approval. And sometimes there's a career board to choose amongst the several candidates who might be competing for a single open slot. Um, Often, if it's something you're interested in, you can shadow the team and help out before becoming a team member to show that you'd be an asset in advance. The positions can be very highly sought after and limited in how many people can participate in them. Uh, Our ERT in Philadelphia is considered the absolute top of ERT teams in the FBI. And I think we actually have one of the largest teams, especially for the size of our office. Um, And so those positions can be very, very competitive. There's a lot of extra training and equipment 
that you receive as one of these collateral team members, and that can get expensive. So technically trained agents are generally selected from people that have been participating in that shadowing or on the job experience for a while. And just like the ideal candidate to become a special agent, you need to show that same drive and dedication to getting a collateral duty. So it's usually up to the people who run the teams, who are the team heads and the supervisors in the office who hold the career boards. But the thing that really gives people a leg up is showing that they have an interest in participating on the team by providing assistance to them before it becomes a collateral duty. And we do want to stress that when we say collateral duty, that means that the agent still has all of his investigative duties. Absolutely. And this is something extra. (laughs) Right. Because like I said, there is no agent that is not a type A personality. And I say to myself all the time, I can't believe I have 18 years in the FBI. It feels like I just started and there's still so much that I want to do because there's so many opportunities available once you're on board, uh, including all these fantastic collateral positions. Well, I'm going to skip around and just go to Robert's. The next question uh, after the question after seems like it, it, it fits right in. And he wanted to know how often and in what cases would an FBI special agent become a first responder? I thought this was a very interesting question. And I I actually really had to think about what I wanted to discuss with this one, because the FBI, we're not a reactive organization. So if you feel your life is in immediate danger, you don't call the FBI, you call 911. Um, But that being said, there have been numerous examples of agents that came across life or death situations just like any civilian would, maybe while they were driving or walking down the street. But because of our training and our natural drive and desire to help and to run toward the burning building instead of coming out of it, they've made the difference between someone living or dying. So certainly on a day like 9-11, agents were responding to the Twin Towers, to the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania. Um, We can be first responders and have been during a terrorist event when we're serving overseas as a legal attache. Agents conduct searches and arrests. We serve warrants. We break down doors. So there have certainly been situations where we were the first responders during that type of an event. So we're not a reactive agency. We're primarily an investigative one. So we would not be the first responders ordinarily, but because of the nature of FBI employees, we're always hearing about stories about an FBI agent saving somebody in a situation. That's another of one of those amazing things about being an agent is we get that training that will stay with us for the rest of our lives so that we will always be one of those individuals who rushes in to help when we see the need. And I do know that on uh, on most SWAT teams, there is a person that's uh, designated as, as yes. a medic. So, uh, so in that situation, that person actually has emergency medical training. Yeah, I want to say we have close to a dozen EMTs in the Philadelphia field office. And SWAT teams will always have somebody with medical training in place. And we all receive first aid training as agents. Now, Robert's next question, you touched on a little bit. And in this episode's show notes, I'm going to list the FBI's core competencies. But he wants to know, given the the diverse employment background of special agents, if there is something they have in common, what are the core competencies that would qualify you for being a competitive FBI special agent candidate? So Robert has obviously been doing his research because he has the correct phraseology and everything. So that is exactly what we call them are our core competencies. So you will have that through Jerry's notes. It's available at fbijobs.gov, but I'm just going to go through them very quickly. So the core competencies are collaboration, communication, flexibility, adaptability, initiative, leadership, organizing and planning, and problem-solving judgment. So we look for people of high moral character 
with a diverse and wide range of experiences. So along with those core competencies, those are also elements that every good candidate would have in place. We want people that are self-motivators and that always have had a drive to achieve, like I said, that type A, triple type A personality. And obviously, we want someone that believes wholeheartedly in the mission of the FBI, which is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution of the United States. So those are the traits that we will see with every good and viable candidate. But I cannot stress enough how important being familiar with those core competencies and how your experiences, professional and personal life experiences, that you can discuss elements from your life that tie into those core competencies. That really is what will successfully propel you through the application process. You are right. Robert really knows what he's talking about because he he was able to get a spot on the Citizens Academy, which as, uh, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about the, the Citizens Academy? So the Citizens Academy is an amazing opportunity through the Philadelphia Field Office. We have it with our community outreach program, and we look for leaders in the community in a very diverse way. So we try to look at people from uh, religious institutions, from corporate entities. We like to call them our ambassadors. So they are people coming to us from the community that spend several weeks learning about the FBI, coming in, talking to agents, learning what the FBI is really all about. So then when they go back out into the community, they become our ambassadors and they can talk to people about who the FBI really is, what we really do. And it is a fantastic opportunity for individuals that have positions of leadership in the community to come in and learn about the real FBI. It's not usually an opportunity where someone who is applying for the FBI is able to get. Robert has one last question. Okay. And I I do think it's a good one. And it's about placement. He wants to know that first assignment that you have, what does that placement look like? Are you more likely to be placed at a division or a field office? Or are you going to get one of those smaller resident agency? And he also wants to know if there is a probationary period and how does that work? Okay. This is a question I actually get a lot, especially regarding the probationary period. So you spend your first two years as an agent on probation. And those first two years can be very different depending on the size of the office you're in. Every new agent will be assigned a training agent. So someone who's senior that's responsible for getting that new agent all of the experience that they can fit into their first couple of years. Everybody has a book that they are required to fill out. So there are certain elements that you need to do while you're on probation. Uh, For example, you need to swear out search warrants serve subpoenas, testify in a grand jury proceeding. And if you're in a smaller office, you may be doing that right off the bat as a case agent because you're working multiple violations all at the same time. So in a smaller office, a resident agency or an RA, you might only have six or seven agents, which means that they're working the 300 plus violations that the FBI is responsible for all at once. But in a larger office, you're assigned to a squad over a dedicated area, like a bank robbery squad or counterintelligence. And then you obviously won't get the same broad exposure to the variety of elements. So those first couple of years, you're really dedicated to getting a wide ranging exposure to a variety of experiences, whether that's through your training agent or just the work you're doing, maybe because you're in a smaller office. And then In terms of where you're most likely to go, statistically, you're more likely to go to a headquarters city office because that's where most agents are in terms of numbers. But there's a phrase, and Jerry, I know you're familiar with this, that everyone gets to know very quickly in the FBI, and that's needs of the bureau. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) (laughs) So if you have a skill set that a resident agency or a, um, a lot of people call them satellite offices, we call them RAs in the bureau then the administrative ASAC of the headquarters city, they will place you 
where the FBI needs you, whether that is in a smaller resident agency or you remain in headquarters city. So, so statistically, in terms of sheer numbers, you're more likely to go to a headquarters city office, but it all comes down to can say it in unison needs of the, the bureau. bureau. <laughs> That's so true. And and I think many people have heard me say that during episodes. The next question is from Todd. He says that the hardest part of the application process for for him is the physical aspect. Uh, He would love to hear a history about the physical fitness training program, and he'd love to get any hints or tips or tricks that you have that can help him beat it. (laughs) I don't think there are any. (laughs) No. and Got to do the work. And it's funny that you're laughing with the phrase beat it because that was my first reaction too. So (laughs) first, there is no beating it. You either pass it or you don't. And the physical fitness test, I'm going to refer to it as the PFT because we in the FBI love our acronyms. But the PFT is like math. Uh, The answer is either right or it's wrong. And there's nothing subjective about the PFT. But I do have some tips for how you can successfully pass it, not beat it, but pass it. You have to study the test to take the test, which means doing it over and over in the closest that you can come to the actual test conditions. So that means stay off the treadmill and go to the track. It means keeping those breaks in between your events to five minutes. And you really, really need to look at those protocols carefully. So our push-ups, for example, are very different than military or other law enforcement agency push-ups. They're exaggerated. You need to break a 90-degree angle when you come down and you push up the entire way as you're coming out of the motion. To ensure that you fully understand the protocols, we have videos online to help you prepare properly so that you are doing the correct motion before you come out to take the test. And you need to make sure you're doing them in order. So the order of the four events is sit-ups, a 300-meter sprint, push-ups, and a mile and a half run. And I've suggested to people get a friend to watch you and to time you and record yourself to watch yourself, to make sure to verify you're hitting those correct protocol points. But you can't think that strength training and becoming a gym rat is going to be good enough because that's a trap a lot of people fall into. They think, oh, I'm in really great shape, so I can come out and I can breeze through this test. And we have people who obviously they look like they're in peak physical condition and they don't pass it because they weren't studying the test itself. The other thing I really have to stress is make sure that you're only taking those five minute breaks in between. So you really want to try to duplicate the conditions that you will be in when you go out to take it in the field. So you need to receive at least a passing score of 12 with one point in every category to get through the PFT. And what we warn everybody is when you're doing your self-evaluation, if you are scoring around a 12, you're not going to pass it when you come out and take it with us. And if you're only passing it with us with a 12 or a 13, you're not going to pass it when you go to Quantico. You really need to make sure that you are taking the test constantly in order to prepare for it. And then in terms of the history of the PFT, onboard agents only recently started to take the physical fitness test again as an annual test in the field. So they had done it in the past, in the distant past, but a director Comey reinstated it a few years ago. And he did that because he said he saw a lot of agents that looked like they needed a, a pick me up. He saw a lot of people sitting in front of computers and he said, we need to make sure that we are maintaining that public image of an FBI agent as somebody who is able to respond quickly to any type of situation, which means we all need to be participating in the training once we're on board, not just getting in. The test itself has changed a lot over the years. The protocols are constantly changing. We just changed the protocols for our sit-ups, for example. That just changed in October. So you need to make sure when you're doing research about coming into the FBI that you're only looking at official FBI information. So you want to talk to your recruiter, your applicant coordinator, and you want to stick with the official FBI websites because a lot of what you're going to see out there, uh, like the wikis and the blogs that give you these hints, the information isn't accurate because it's old, it's outdated. 
So if our protocol changes, you want to make sure that you're using the uh, latest test, which means you need to go to fbijobs.gov to confirm that. Now, I did download an FBI fitness app. Is, yes. that, is that an official FBI um, product? It, it is. And I know that I had uh, something about that on one of the other questions, but I'm glad that you brought it up now because that was something that we developed to help people to get ready for the test by taking the test. So it detects your movement. It's not going to tell you if you came up high enough or went down low enough in the push-ups, but it is going to detect whether or not you are making a range of movement. So it will tell you, oh, you just did 10 push-ups, and it will help you with the timing of taking only five-minute breaks in between or the timing of only having one minute for your sit-ups or how long you have for the 300-meter sprint. So that app is an FBI authorized app, and it is something that we recommend that you use while preparing for the fit test. All right, I'm going to throw another question at you. What does the FBI do for onboard agents to encourage physical fitness? Here in Philadelphia, everybody always wants to run across the bridge. We have lots of basketball pickup games. We have softball games. Um, I know, especially in Los Angeles, somebody always had a softball game that they were looking for an extra teammate. So I think it's really just ingrained in agents that we need to remain physically fit to fulfill our duties. And now having the fit test reinstated, it's just something that helps to guide and gauge us and, and keep that in uh, the forefront that, well, you are going to be tested on it as well. So make sure you're staying in shape. Isn't there also time built into the weekly schedule to keep up with physical fitness? And, and, and I take it that the Philadelphia division still has the on-site gym. Absolutely. And I'm very glad that you brought that up because, again, I think it's just that it's so ingrained that everybody works out anyway that I don't even think about that as a perk. And that's actually a huge perk. So the FBI does encourage you with an extra two hours a week that goes down toward your official time on the job to work out uh, while you're at work. We have a full gym in our office and actually they're going to be updating the gym. So you are encouraged in an official way as well as your peers constantly after you to uh, to hit the gym or um, the pavement to go for a run. Oh, I had to get in there and see that updated gym. I was on the original committee when that gym was put into the Philadelphia office. Yeah, it's it still is crowded. Every time I go in there, there are plenty of people on all of the machines. And, and then if the weather's nice, you always have people who will do the weights there and then they'll gather together and go for a run outside. Being in the FBI culture, you know, I'm, I'm still hitting the gym, doing my kickboxing and <laughs> classes and everything. So uh, it just becomes part of your DNA to, to try to stay fit and represent the FBI. Well, and you also realize and recognize the health benefits because so many people, by the time we're ready to retire in our early 50s, that's another reason I think that we go out and we look for other positions because we might, in terms of age, be 50, but we probably have the, the bodies and the stamina of somebody 15 years younger because of that, that mindset, uh, that lifestyle that's ingrained in us. True. Very true. The next question is from Stephen. And Stephen wants to know, is an agent required to live in the city where they're assigned? That is probably my shortest answer. Uh, no, <laughs> not, not at all. So I know a lot of local law enforcement that they do require that you live in the city in which you are assigned. And that is not the case with the FBI. Well, we can take that further and let them know, let him know that you're not even required to live in the state. Exactly. I was in the Philadelphia division for 24 years. Uh, most of that, I lived in New Jersey. And uh, the same for many agents in the Philadelphia division now who live in Delaware. I think we probably have more people living in New Jersey and Delaware than we do in Pennsylvania. I take it that Stephen is concerned about being possibly assigned to the New York 
division because he asked a question about an agent's commute and he's wondering if an hour or more commute for an agent assigned to an office is reasonable given the workload of an agent and he and he wants to know if this can become troublesome for an agent's career. He gives the example of somebody living in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, who commutes to the New York field office for work. Right. So one of the big perks of being an FBI agent is for the vast majority of us, you are assigned a bureau car. So your car and your gas is paid for by the FBI. So one of the reasons that the bureau supplies you with that is Although I did say we're not a reactive organization, you do have to be able to respond if a situation occurs. So if there is an event like a 9-11, they want you to be able to get to the scene. So you can't rely on public transportation as an FBI agent. But that being said, we are in exactly the same boat that a lot of the country is. If you have an office in a high cost of living area, a long commute can just be another situation that an agent deals with because we need to live further outside in order to have affordable housing. So it really is up to the individual agent. I would say the vast majority of us that work in a central city location such as Philadelphia, we all live probably a good hour or so away when you factor in traffic. My first office was the Los Angeles field office. So insert a traffic joke there. I could have lived right across the street from the field office, and I probably still would have had a 40-minute commute. So that's just one of those things that we deal with just like any other member of the public. There are lots of people that work in the New York field office and live in Bucks County. It's one of the reasons that the Philadelphia field office is so highly sought after is because of the people that work in New York but live closer to Philadelphia and Bucks County. So he would not be unique in that. It's just another one of those things that an agent has, just like any other member of the public. You have to ask yourself how early you want to start your commute and how late you want to get home in the evening. It's really a work-life balance, but you would not be alone if you had a long commute. Stephen has another question, and it has to do with eyesight. He wants to know, what is the eyesight required to correct your vision? And if that can be corrected through contacts or glasses. Okay. So we do have a vision requirement. Um, An agent has to have corrected 20-20 in one eye and at least 20-40 in the other. So there are lots of onboard agents who wear glasses. But when you're at Quantico, it's a little different. You are able to wear glasses, but because so much of the training that you're going through at Quantico is very physical, everything from wrestling to boxing to um, defensive tactics, that you should be wearing a a pair of sports glasses or a pair that won't break easily, a pair that you can keep on with a strap or some sort of apparatus. So for that reason, most people at Quantico do opt to wear contact lenses as opposed to glasses, but you can wear glasses. And there are lots of agents, once you're an onboard agent, that opt to wear glasses versus contact lenses. But we do have all of the physical requirements. We have descriptions of what would be required in terms of your medical history available at fbijobs.gov. We have a section specifically dedicated to your vision parameters um, and some uh, guidance for you to go off of at fbijobs.gov. And there is also a uh, color vision because there are a lot of men in the country that um, are colorblind. And there is a component of that that is required as well. So you can be colorblind as an agent, but it depends on the degree and the type of colorblindness that you have. Very interesting. 
All right, Stephen's next question is, oh, this is a, this is kind of a tricky one. I, I can't wait to see how you answer it. <laughs> he says that he has a friend that recently graduated from Quantico, and he also says that he read in a special agent brochure that if you select New York or LA or, or some of the large offices as your number one choice for assignment, that you're almost guaranteed to get it. He wants to know if that's accurate. So the chief phrase in there is just about guaranteed as opposed to guaranteed. If you keep in that just about, then yes, that is correct. So Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, and San Juan, if you choose one of those offices as your number one choice, you are just about guaranteed to get one of those. So they are large offices in high cost of living areas. They're always looking for people to come in because so many agents, after they've had some time in the FBI, if they've served in one of those larger offices, many of them may have gone into that office without having a family. They weren't concerned about buying a house or sending children to school. And they find after a time that they want to move to a lower cost of living office, which means that as they're cycling out of those larger offices, they're always looking for people to come into them. So if people choose one of those as their number one choice, they are very, very likely to get it. For me, I came out of Los Angeles, so I was thrilled to go back home. And I think it's very different if you're from one of those areas, you realize that it's not as scary and expensive and you're fine with going back to an LA or a New York. So that's another thing. If you process out of one of those larger offices, you'll find that there's generally not a problem with you going back to it. Now, we're moving on to Jackie's question, and we're back to the physical fitness. Mm -hmm. She admits that she's in terrible shape. <laughs> <laughs> and, she, and she wanted to know if we had any you know, suggestions, and this is very similar to the, the other question that we had, uh, any suggestions on how to reach these fitness requirements. And she wanted to know if being an attorney, being a lawyer, would give her any leeway from having to meet those physical fitness requirements? <laughs> First, I want to stress that the only position that the FBI has that has a physical fitness component is special agent. So as I was saying earlier, that's less than half of the FBI workforce. So if you're not someone that's naturally inclined toward being physically fit, there may be another role that you would be suited for. But if you're just being facetious in the way that you ask the question and you're just looking for tips, we have some excellent guides at fbijobs.gov for working on your fitness. So I kept stressing to take the test, but we do also have a physical fitness guide. It's about 12 pages long uh, for ways to strengthen your upper body, um, some different techniques for you to start to incorporate into your workout routine. As I said, when the time comes to apply, I will tell people this until I'm blue in the face. You need to study for the physical fitness test by taking the test. That is where the uh, the app will come in handy. That's where having a friend that can help you by watching you and making sure that you're hitting the protocols, uh, that's when that person can become um, so invaluable. And again, make sure that you are doing it on a regular basis and that you are doing it in test conditions similar to what you would be doing out in the field. So make sure you're doing that outside, not in a gym on the treadmill. And then in terms of leeway as an attorney, so yes and no, we do have minimum requirements. It is not going to make any difference whether you're an attorney in terms of the physical fitness. So everybody has to pass exactly the same test, but there is a difference with the professional work experience requirement. So with an undergraduate degree only, it's two years minimum professional work experience. And with a graduate degree, which would include a JD, it's one year professional work. So as an attorney, you don't have the same professional work experience requirement as somebody with an undergraduate degree only. So sorry, Jackie, it's not going to help you with the physical fitness, but it might in terms of the minimum qualifications uh, regarding your professional work experience. And I also want to discuss a little bit how we define professional work experience, because that's something that also will confuse people. 
So they'll say, I just graduated from college and I've been working for two years. Now it's time for me to apply to the FBI. And my answer to that is not necessarily. So we define professional work experience as non-entry level. It's something that required responsibility or something that you needed to have a degree in order to hold. So again, we're looking for people who can effectively discuss how they embody those core competencies, those core traits. And you need to have a proper amount of real world experience and maturity in order to do that effectively. So it often will surprise people to learn that the average age of a new agent trainee reporting to Quantico is 31. This is not a job that you get directly out of college. It's not a job for someone that hasn't already spent some time in another profession and a profession that they were very successful at because if they weren't, they will not be able to hit those core competencies um, effectively. So as I was saying earlier, people ask all the time, what degree should I declare? What type of a job should I get into? If you look at those core competencies, you will see that there are any number of professions that you would be able to develop those traits It really comes down to more whether it's something that you had a drive and a passion for, because that's when you're going to be a natural leader, a natural communicator, somebody who has flexibility, adaptability. So going back all the way to the beginning of your question, it is not going to help you in terms of your physical fitness, but the uh, greater education that somebody has, it will affect the amount of professional work experience that you were required. As the mother of twin daughters who are in the fitness field, they're both exercise science majors, I would also suggest that if you really, really are having a hard time with the physical fitness, that you consider hiring a personal trainer and giving that personal trainer the FBI requirements, showing them exactly what the protocols are. And maybe if you have somebody out there, you know, kicking your butt every day, not Only will you get into shape, but you'll get used to what it will be like when you get to the FBI Academy. We had a a young woman who just came into the Philadelphia field office and she processed through our field office. So I was able to see her before she took the physical fitness test. And now here she is a brand new agent in Philadelphia. And she is phenomenal. She is an amazing young woman. She is bringing so many wonderful things to the FBI, but she struggled the first time that she took our PFT and she did not pass. And you have three opportunities to take that test before you are knocked out of the process forever, permanent disqualification. So it is incredibly important that you never fail any of the tests, but she did fail it the first time that she took it. And she did exactly what you suggest, Jerry. She went out, she hired a professional, gave them the protocols. She came back and passed the second time, no problem, and then went on to Quantico. Now, Jackie has another question. And, you know, we keep in mind that she told us that she was 34, you know, as you as you answer this, but her final question is about the drug policy. She made the mistake of trying some of those edible marijuana things when uh, she was out in Colorado on vacation. And now she's not sure when she should apply. Does she still have time to apply? She does. So it's it's three years from the time of your last use this is specifically for marijuana use, three years from the time of your last use until you can put in your application. Jackie, because you used it a year and a half ago, and it's a three-year minimum wait from the time you put in your application, you have at least another year and a half before you can put in your application. So you are hitting it pretty close because you cannot put in an application unless you have a veteran's age waiver, which puts you into another whole bracket. You cannot put in your application past the age of 36. So you will be right there on the brink when you put in your application, but you you will still make it. But this brings up something else that I really want to stress. When it comes to our drug policy, and all of that is available at fbijobs.gov, but I'm going to relate it right now to marijuana since that's what we're already discussing. You need to make sure that you are in compliance with our drug policy before you walk in to take that polygraph examination. There is nothing more frustrating for a recruiter than to have someone fail a polygraph for something so foolish as lying about drug usage. 
So if you have any concerns about the timing of your last usage, and if it falls under our policy, our recommendation is just wait to put in your application. There is no penalty for putting your application on hold. But if you fail an FBI-administered polygraph, you are disqualified for life, forever being an FBI employee, and most likely an employee of any federal government agency. Because when you take your polygraph with any other group, they're going to ask you if you've ever failed any other agency's administered polygraph examination. So it is not worth risking it. Do not think you can beat the polygraph because I guarantee you can't. So we have all of the details that you should need about our drug policy at fbijobs.gov. And if you have any specific concerns or questions, you really should reach out to your local recruiter and talk about it. We have heard everything. Um, There's nothing that you can ask us that's going to shock us. You want to make sure that you pass it by a recruiter before you put in an application and possibly end up getting yourself into a situation where you would need to pull your application after you've already been going through the process and you waste even more time. So don't think you can beat the poly. Make sure that you're in compliance. And if you have any questions, reach out to your local recruiter to ask us about your specific situation. And I do want to say to Jackie that you can look at this as somewhat positive news in the fact that you have a year and a half to get into shape. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And you can do it. You can Absolutely. do it. Oh, we've, we've had people, I had somebody in my Quantico class that lost 150 pounds before he became an FBI agent. Wow. So yeah, he, he was a fantastic physical specimen, but he had not always been in great physical shape. He lost 150 pounds. So anybody with the right mindset and the right drive can get themselves into the condition that they need to be in to become an agent. And then once they get in, the culture itself will help them maintain that. Exactly. All right, this question is from Billy. And Billy is currently earning an MBA in forensic accounting and fraud. Yay, that was my, uh, (laughs) that's what I spent most of my career doing, uh, you know, fraud, uh, economic crime and fraud investigations. So, hey, Billy. Every day, he becomes more intrigued with working for the FBI or the IRS, our other government agencies, and definitely we encourage him to look at all of them and and find the one that's the right fit for him. He wants to become a criminal investigator for, for economic crimes. He is curious if you have any words of wisdom or know of any special programs that are offered around the country that would help him gain forensic accounting experience or allow him to stand out on a government application. Okay. Jerry, please, at the uh, end of my answer, if you have anything specific to add, since this was your realm for so long, uh, you might have some knowledge that I don't as a recruiter. First, I, I can't make recommendations for particular schools or programs, but I would like to go back to what we were discussing earlier about those core competencies. So having professional and life experience that you can draw on when you're talking about a human body, those core traits is key. So we look for someone with practical subject matter expertise that ties into those qualities like leadership, collaboration, and working on a team. So having the life that shows you're the embodiment of those traits is the best way to stand out and to prepare for the agent position. Lots of people think there's a formula. And what I tell them is there's not except for those those core competencies. And what makes you the best applicant or the best candidate goes back to that. And one of the reasons for that is I'm not a mind reader. No one is. No one in the FBI can predict what the next critical skill is that the FBI needs beyond those core traits. So 10 years ago, nobody would say that the FBI would need somebody who's an expert in artificial intelligence. When I came into the FBI, I was labeled a cyber body because I knew HTML. So I'm sure that all of the computer scientists out there listening to that, they're laughing right now. That just gives you an idea, though, of how quickly things change. So we can't really tell you, oh, become an expert in this, and it's going to make you a fantastic candidate beyond those core traits. 
So we are not expecting a hiring freeze anytime soon. It's exactly the opposite because so many people who came in right after 9-11, they're going to be eligible to retire in 2022, 2023. But I'd be doing anybody a disservice if I said to you, go out and get this degree, pursue this type of certification, choose this kind of a career, and then something happens and you end up not coming into the FBI. So what I would have done is I would have told you, follow a path that you don't have an innate interest in, that you don't have a natural inclination to pursue. And if being an FBI agent or FBI employee doesn't happen for you, now you're in a position that you have a career that you didn't really want. You're not getting the end result that you hoped for. And those core traits are not going to be developed as effectively as if you were in a field that interested you. So you're much more likely to become a leader or a great communicator if you're involved in a pursuit that you're actually interested in. So it sounds like you're very interested in learning more about forensic accounting, about pursuing um, an economic crimes pathway. Then what you really need to do is find a career that you would be happy to stay in for 50 years. Develop all of those traits, all of those qualities, develop all of that subject matter expertise. And if you find after a couple of years of being in that career, hey, this isn't exactly what I want to do because now I've gained all of this great experience and I really want to apply it to a group like the FBI or the IRS or some other organization. So I don't want to give you guidance for a specific certification or program so much as tell you really pursue what you have a passion for and a drive for, because that is what stands out first on your resume. And then later on, as you're going through the selection process and you're interacting with an agent who wants to learn more about your qualities and your professional experience. I think your answer is excellent. I do want to say, though, that I spent most of my career working these type of cases, and I have a psychology degree. The education I obtained on the job during my FBI career. And the other thing that I wanted to just say, and I, and I believe that I, when I got this email, I sent the information to Billy. But when I was on the FBI jobs website, I saw that they were actually looking for forensic accountants, not necessarily for the special agent position. So that is also something that he wants to take in consideration. Absolutely. And generally, because that's another very competitive position, we do look for people that have a CPA for a forensic accountant position, but we also have auditors. We also have um, financial analysts. So there are lots of opportunities for gaining that professional real world experience from within the FBI. And then at some point, if you decide that you would like to try the role of agent, you're already an onboard employee, which is invaluable because you have that shared language. When you go in for your oral interview, you will be able to draw on real FBI cases that you've worked on to uh, discuss the uh, experience that you have. Related to that and what I was discussing before, there, there will, and what you said, Jerry, about having a psychology degree, but then um, working the majority of your career in something different than your degree. There, there will always be a job for people from the cyber industry or people with language skills or accountants or attorneys in the FBI, but there will also always be a place for a high school teacher or a nurse or a social worker to become an agent. So the best hard charging excellent professional that somebody can be, that is the best recipe for becoming a successful applicant for a special agent. Well, we could end this episode right there with that response. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't. But uh, that really does say, does say everything. Now, the next set of questions comes from Russell, and they're all related to the military. So I think there are going to be a number of people who are going to be uh, interested in these answers. And I, I love his, his first question. He wanted to know what are the main cultural differences between the FBI and the military? He wants to know 
the general difficulties, if there are any general difficulties for veterans who are adjusting you know, to this new environment if they join the FBI. And one of the things that he's really concerned about, one of his reservations about coming into the FBI is that he doesn't want to replace one large federal bureaucracy with another. Okay. I did not come into the FBI with a military background, but I have worked with dozens of people who have. So I'm not going to be relating to my personal experience as a former member of the military, but I've had numerous conversations with FBI agents and professional support employees who came to us from the military. So we have a ton of former military and current reservists serving right now in the Bureau. And from what I've been told, it is a very easy transition. But the FBI is also a very different place than the military environment that they came from. So we are a quasi-military organization. As Jerry, you mentioned earlier, when it comes to chain of command, that's just one of the elements that we share with the military. So we have a chain of command, but in many ways, especially in the agent role, you, you are your own boss. So the field acts like its own unit, and then the squad you're assigned to is sometimes like its own special forces team. But I think there's a lot more flexibility in the FBI, especially within the field, and we're not as regimented as the military is. But as I said, from what I've been told, it is a very easy transition for military members, and there's a lot of elements within the FBI that they recognize and that they're very comfortable with and that they feel fluent in. So, uh, and then in terms of your concern about trading one giant bureaucracy for another, this will relate to the FBI as a part of the government. So a lot of things that occur within the government, the FBI, we don't have control over that. But as an organization, we sometimes we'll make up for other things that are taking place within the government as an individual organization. The bureaucracy part of the FBI, a lot of that comes down to who we answer to as an organization, because we have to answer to the executive branch, to the um, to Congress. And a lot of that, those are things that are out of our control. But then within the Bureau, the individuals that make up the FBI, because we are so mission focused, a lot of the bureaucratic parts of the Bureau really doesn't touch us in many ways on a daily basis. So we still have to be in compliance with lots of things that are imposed on us as a government organization. But we find that a lot of times that doesn't really interfere with what we do on a day to day basis. So I actually feel pretty comfortable with us as part of this larger bureaucracy because we are so mission-oriented and driven and focused on what the FBI is about and what we need to get taken care of on a daily basis. Now, Stephen has several more years of service. He's in the military now, and he has several more years of service. And he was wondering if he could get a conditional offer, you know, actually start in the application process and kind of hold a slot for a future class, you know, keep his foot in the door. Is that possible? So that's a complicated answer. So it's sort of a yes and a no. So you cannot hold a future slot. And the numbers that I'm going to be giving you, they're not exact because it's going to vary by the candidate because a lot of it has to do with how long it's going to take you to get through your background investigation. So you need to be prepared to report to Quantico within 120 days after the completion of your background check. So most candidates take about a year from the time they apply until they get a conditional job offer and are told to report to Quantico. The beginning part of the application process requires that you are within the United States because you have to be physically present for the beginning phases of the application. So if you're deployed and it's long term, you may want to wait a while. So unless you're about a year out from separation of service and you know that you'll be stateside for the first few months after you apply, you may want to wait. That being said, we do have age waivers in place for veterans. 
So keeping in mind that there are some amazing candidates out there that might not make that age 36 mandatory cutoff while they remain in service, we do have an age waiver for our veterans below the rank of major or veterans above the rank of major who separated from service with a disability. There's a lot more detail about what we have available for our veterans at fbijobs.gov. We have a section specifically dedicated to our veteran applicants and questions that they might have. And I will say again, get in touch with your local recruiter because each person's situation is going to be a little bit different. And that's particularly the case when it comes to our military members that have a period of time remaining for their service contract or that have different elements involved in their deployments. But at the end of the day, you need to think about that 120-day window from the time that you complete your background investigation. Keep in mind, it takes about a year on average for people from the time they put in their application until their background investigation is completed. And also keep in mind that you need to be stateside when you first put in your application because the first phases of your uh, selection process require that you be physically within the United States. The great thing about Russell's questions are that I'm sure there's a lot of people with military background listening, and it's great to have these detailed questions that really are going to apply to a lot of people that are applying. Absolutely. So, so his next question is that a major incentive of delaying his, his application to the FBI is his desire to transfer his GI Bill to his kids. But that requires that he stay in the military for 10 years of service. And he wants to know if the FBI offers any equivalent dependent educational benefit or incentive program that could be transferred. I wish. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I wish. Um, that is not a program that we do have, and it is one of the most amazing perks of military service. It was something I actually wasn't familiar with until fairly recently when I got involved in recruitment because of how many agents I know that have children about to graduate from high school that are considering the military specifically for that reason, and lots of FBI employees that have served in the military that are now able to offer that to their own children. That is a fantastic benefit to military service. So we do not have that equivalent within the FBI, but we do have a couple of pretty amazing programs that I would like to highlight. So we do have a student loan repayment program for employees. So not every employee who applies for that will receive it, but I know a lot of people who have participated in that and had thousands and thousands of dollars that were paid for by the government um, that they still owed as a student loan. We also have a continuing education program that covers tuition costs for advanced degrees. So I know a number of people, I am married to one who took advantage of that program and was able to utilize it to go on and get an advanced degree. So we do not have that amazing program that the military has, but we do have lots of other uh, programs within the FBI that recognizes the benefit to the Bureau of our employees gaining additional academic and uh, educational experiences, but we do not have it for our employees' children. Russell has one last question, sure. and it is about uh, reserve duty. He wants to know if he has to renounce any reserve or National Guard affiliations in order to join the FBI. This is a very short answer. The answer is no, not at all. We have military reservists in the FBI, and we allow you to serve in the National Guard as well. So absolutely not. I, I work constantly with someone who is a colonel in the Marine Corps as a member of the reserves. So we 100% honor our agent and professional support employees commitment to remaining within the military. And we share so many of our core values with our armed services brethren and sisters 
that um, we have a full recognition of our employees not wanting to completely sever that tie. And we completely honor our employees' commitment to remaining within the military. Very good. So Alex has a fun question. She wants to know how similar in depiction is the training at the FBI Academy shown in the TV show Quantico? You know, is the vigor and intensity the same? Next question. (laughs) (laughs) Did you ever watch Quantico? You know, my husband and I watched it for probably the first 15 minutes of the first episode because, hey, it's a brand new show about the FBI. It's called Quantico. And after about 15 minutes, we said, yeah, we can't watch this anymore. <laughs> we, we are the worst critics when it comes to the way that popular media depicts the FBI because it so often is so wrong and completely the opposite of who we really are, how we really act, how we really look, the backgrounds that we have. So yeah, I've, I watched it for about 15 minutes. The way that we're depicted in popular media, along with driving me crazy. Uh, It does bring a lot of interest from the public to the FBI. So in that way, it's a positive. But then what I want to make sure people understand is that it is not realistic. And if you would like to have a realistic idea of what Quantico is really like, we have our own YouTube channel. And that is available through FBIjobs.gov. It's up in the upper right-hand corner when you go to the website. And there is a fantastic series of videos on there that I always recommend called the Becoming an Agent series. And it depicts Quantico very realistically and talks to you about what it's actually like. So Quantico, it's, it's a very intense 21 weeks, physically intense, emotionally intense. It is going to push everybody to their absolute limits, but that's the point of it. Because when you walk out of there with your credentials and a gun, you are an FBI agent. And you need to be prepared for absolutely anything. So I tell applicants all the time, it's so tough at Quantico because when you leave there, you're an agent in exactly the same way as someone with 20 years on the job. So a victim, a subject, a local law enforcement official, they're not going to say when they meet you, oh, that's a new agent. So we're going to take it easy on them. You are an FBI agent in every single way with all of the skills and the reputation It comes with that title. So you need to be ready for that job the day that you leave. And that is why Quantico is so tough and why it is not the way that it was depicted in the TV show, (laughs) because you need to be prepared for that real job the day that you leave it. And I highly, highly recommend that Becoming an Agent series if you want to get a better idea of what Quantico is really like. Yeah, that was a great series. And I'll I'll make sure this is going to be a packed show notes for this episode, because I'll make sure there is a direct link for that YouTube uh, channel series. I have to say that I did watch the first uh, probably two or three episodes of Quantico, and I, I, I had to stop. I just couldn't get through it. It, uh, it. it just was just so over the top and so ridiculous. I will say that I have been watching the new TV show FBI on on CBS. And although they do take some creative license, a lot of creative license to make it more dramatic, that it is it is a little bit more realistic. And what I've been doing every week is after the show, I write a blog post pointing out what they got right, what they got wrong, and where they took creative license. And and basically, that's for people who are enjoying the show, but need to be educated on how the FBI really does things. So That's fantastic. Now I have to check out your blog, which is going to give me even less time to uh, to do all of the things that I'm supposed to be doing because I could totally get lost reading all that. But I've been DVRing that show and I haven't had an opportunity to watch it yet. And I don't remember the name of the actor who is the lead male agent in the series, but I did read something about how he got the role. And if anybody who's interested in reading about that, it, it's a fantastic story about how he got the role. And I love the fact that we have um, somebody from a different culture in that position, because that's something that we need to really let the public know is that we are made up of an incredibly diverse 
workforce. And we have every culture, every religion, every country represented within the FBI. So you have to be a U.S. citizen to be an FBI employee, but that doesn't mean you needed to be born in the United States. And if we can get more people to come into the FBI with these diverse, rich, cultural backgrounds, that is so valuable for us because then when we go out into communities made up of those cultures, we have an automatic ambassador. We have an immediate bridge to develop a dialogue with people. And we really need to get the word out as effectively as possible that the FBI is made up of all different types of people and that we need all different types of people to come in to remain an effective organization. And I guess that's one of the good things about TV shows, even if they are dramatic, is the (laughs) fact that they do show a very diverse workforce definitely lets people who are watching the show say, oh, maybe this is for me. Absolutely. The next question is from Cody. And Cody wants to know if there is any possibility that he can join the FBI without a high school diploma. He never went to college to further his education. And he just wants to know if there is a, you know, any skills that that he has that we might be able to use in the FBI because he thinks it's such an amazing job and he would love to be able to to travel around and, and solve crimes for the FBI. It's funny that you just said travel around. So a couple of things on that. We have an electrician in our Philadelphia field office who told me the other day that he has visited all but one continent in the world because of his role as an electrician with the FBI. So many people, and this is what we were discussing earlier, so many people only think of the special agent role because that is what you always see in popular media. But there are more than 800 job roles within the FBI. So not just special agent. There are all types of skill sets that we look for um, in practical experience and that we, we really need to have everything done in-house. So as I was saying earlier, there really isn't a job that exists outside of the FBI that we don't have reflected within. We obviously can't take our bureau cars down to Jiffy Lube to get an oil change. We have an automotive unit. We have some amazing tradesmen with decades of experience, sometimes before they came into the FBI. And then certainly we have a wealth of experience that they've gained once they've come in. So there are all kinds of trade positions that we regularly recruit and look for. We do have a lot of people who are retiring from those positions. And as they do, often the new openings are requiring a minimum of a bachelor's degree. But there are still opportunities within the FBI for people uh, with a high school diploma only that have particular skill sets, trade skills that we desperately need. So there really isn't anybody that has a passion and a drive to assist the FBI that has a particular skill set that I would say would be restricted exclusively because of their education. There are different qualifications for different positions, and I'm a broken record here, but fbijobs.gov lists all of the positions we currently have open as well as as well as several of the career pathways that exist and it will contain information about what the qualifications are for each and what the academic qualifications are for each position the main difference is that there is no age limitation for those non-agent positions absolutely so so many of the concerns that people have when it comes to education or professional work experience or the physical requirements or the age requirements, they think that that is for all positions and it is not. That would be for the agent job, that 23 to 36 age range, all of the physical requirements and the education requirements, that is for agent only. Some of the other positions do have education requirements, but it's really only agent that you have to worry about for the age range and the physical requirements. 
All right. This next question from Kayla has to do with educational requirements. She is currently taking the CPA exam and that she knows the Bureau has an interest in applicants with an accounting and finance background. She wants to know if you recommend that she complete the CPA exam and licensing before applying or if she can apply while she's in the process of taking the uh, CPA examination. So as a recruiter, my advice to you is to apply now. So if you already have the professional work experience, so a minimum of two years with an undergraduate degree, so if you hit those minimum qualifications, it is not going to hurt you to apply now. And if a recruiter or applicant coordinator reviews your application and they say, oh, well, she doesn't quite have the professional work experience that we're looking for, you need a little more time on, it's not going to to penalize you to put in your application early and have a recruiter or applicant coordinator review it. Even better, contact your local recruiter or applicant coordinator, show them your resume, have us take a look at it in advance. If you hit the minimum qualifications, I would say apply now before you have completed your CPA because as I said, it's at least a year for most people. The application process from the time that they put in until they receive that conditional job offer letter. And that is an average. For some people, it's much longer than that. So because the application process is so lengthy, you should apply as soon as you hit those minimum qualifications, and then you'll continue to gain your valuable professional work experience as you go through the process. Because we are looking to hire so many people in the next few years, because we are anticipating a lot of our agents retiring within the next 10 years or so. I'm telling people, apply as soon as you hit those minimum qualifications. We do encourage you as a CPA to maintain your license. So the FBI will provide you the opportunity every year. I think it's a 40-hour requirement of continuing education that you need to maintain your CPA licensing. The FBI will afford you the opportunity and they will pay for you to go to get that training so you can maintain that license. Okay. Now the next uh, three questions are from Ashley and Ashley, it looks like she is in the application process already. And she says as she moves forward and if she is selected to go to Quantico, that she wanted to know if there were things that she could be doing now to prepare herself for the academy. She knows that she needs to keep in shape, but are there any study guides or anything to help her, you know, ahead of actually going to the academy? So yes, you want to stay in peak physical shape. Absolutely. You want to eat well, get used to thinking about what you're putting into your body. Jerry, I'm sure you're going to laugh at this, but Quantico food is not necessarily known as being gourmet food, but salads, it is <laughs> salads every day. <laughs> exactly. Um, but but it, it is nutritious and you want to get into the habit of not just reaching for junk food all of the time because that's not going to be available to you there. So eat well, work on your focus because you're really going to need that over those 21 weeks. Be in regular contact with your recruiter or your applicant coordinator Develop a relationship with them long before you go off to Quantico because we're going to give you advice on what you should be taking with you. Probably more importantly, you should leave behind. We're constantly getting updated from agents as they come out of Quantico, what they find valuable. And I always ask our male and our female agents to give me separate lists because often the things that you need as a woman or a man will be different. We will also be giving you Uh, regular updates on if there's been any change in the training that you'll be going through, anything that's coming out of Quantico that you would want to be aware of, your recruiter or your applicant coordinator should be keeping you up to date on that. But that's incumbent upon you to be reaching out to your recruiter and your coordinator. There really isn't anything that you can study in advance, but you need to realize that this isn't this isn't a spa. You're not going to be going on vacation. Um, it's amazing. I have had people contact me that some of the things that they've asked if they should bring, I scratch my head because again, quasi-military organization, and that is certainly the case while you're at Quantico. It is like going to boot camp. So really the main thing that I would tell you is it's going to be an intensive five months and being mentally prepared is probably the biggest piece of advice that I could give you in terms of how you can start preparing now. 
trying to work on your focus, working on eating well, staying in peak physical shape, and getting yourself mentally prepared for going into a boot camp like environment for your 21 weeks. There really aren't any study guides that I would be recommending to you in advance. This is not a plug because anybody listening to this is already listening to the case reviews, but I do believe that listening to the retired agents talk about their cases really gives you an idea of what you're going to be dealing with. And so definitely, I think everybody who applies for the FBI who is listening to FBI Retired Case File Review is already ahead of the game. Absolutely. Again, I'm always really surprised when the first point of contact that I have with an applicant is when they come in for our meet and greet. Um, That's the first interaction that I've had with so many people because I know when I came through, I was doing all kinds of research. I didn't have podcasts like this one to listen to, but gosh, there was some kind of a like a test guide, a study guide that I purchased. What we do really stress to you is that you want to stick with official FBI guidance. So you want to make sure that the material that you are reviewing comes to you through official FBI resources. So your recruiter, your applicant coordinator, through the FBI websites, listening to a podcast like this is fantastic for learning about the FBI and the experiences of FBI agents. And Jerry has this amazing relationship with SAC Harpsters. So she knows what the FBI wants people to be discussing when it comes to our our caseloads. So all of those are fantastic resources that would help to prepare you. Not Quantico or the FBI TV show. <laughs> and not not to prepare you to go for, for sheer entertainment value, maybe. But. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting question. Ashley has heard that some FBI field offices specialize in certain types of cases. She wants to know if that's true and if we could go over which offices might specialize in which kind of crimes. So that's not really accurate, but I think this might be what she's referring to, that there there will be some major cases, um, sometimes ones that you hear about in the news that will come out of particular field offices. And sometimes those cases make that location kind of a hot spot for that type of case because there's been subject matter expertise developed there because of that prior investigation. So Philadelphia, because they were an office that developed a particular type of case, then in the future, they might be known as the field office that has a lot of expertise in that area. And then there are the obvious field office case relationships. For example, pirating products out of Hollywood. So movie intellectual property rights, that might be more of a hot topic in Los Angeles than in Chicago. Or you might find that there are more organized crime cases in the Northeast than in the Southwest. So there will be things like that, but there aren't really offices that become experts in one particular area and then everything goes out of that office. So years ago, the Baltimore field office was the really the only office that worked child pornography because they had the main case file. But then leads from that main case file were sent to offices all across the FBI. So everybody was working those investigations, but the main case file was out of one field office. And we've really moved away from that model. All right. And Ashley's last question, she wants to know if we have any tips for the phase two test and interview. (laughs) Everybody so. wants tips. <laughs> <laughs> so tips, yes, tips are good. So um, yes and no. Uh, I, I know I've answered a lot of questions that way. Uh, so I can give you tips and I can't give you tips past a certain point. Get to know your local recruiter. The way that you can do that is you go to fbijobs.gov and there's a button that says find a recruiter. So click on that and it will direct you to an email bank for your local field office. So make sure that you're talking to your local recruiter to fully prepare you for the phase two oral interview. So uh, again, the only information you should be reviewing is from official FBI sources. Don't go looking on blogs and wikis for advice. 
Uh, one, you're not allowed to do that. And two, the information that you'll be getting will not be accurate. So the phase two oral interview consists of the same questions for everyone. Those core competencies I keep talking about, they will be related to those core competencies. And the questions that you'll be receiving are structured. So you will need to be prepared to talk about a situation in your life, your contribution to that situation, and what the result was. And you need to realize that they will be related to those core competencies. So what I recommend to our candidates in Philadelphia is that they look at each one of those core competencies and they write down three or four examples for each from some element in their lives. It can be something in their professional experience. It can be something from college. It can be from when they were in the Eagle Scout. If it perfectly fits those core competencies, what I tell them is make sure that you are prepared to discuss those from your life and to have three or four examples from each before you walk in for that interview. And the other thing you need to realize is that that panel, they will not know you from your name and your social security number. So you have one hour to tell them as the candidate who you are and to tell them everything that they need to know about you that would make you qualified to be an FBI agent. So it's very important to realize that you need to talk to them in that hour about everything in your life because they won't know where you went to school, what you did prior to putting in your application. So keep that in mind. Keep in mind that the questions that you will be getting will be situation-based and really get familiar with those core competencies. So those are the tips that I can give you. Oh, those are great tips. It sounds like the main thing is this is not the time to be humble. I tell people that all the time. You don't want to be arrogant, but you want to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward because you only have one hour to convince them that you would make a great FBI agent. Now, the last question is from Andrew. And actually, this wasn't even sent in as a question. Andrew just uh, sent me an email. I love getting emails. I get emails every day from people listening to the podcast. And he sent this in. And I responded to him, you know, with my thoughts. And then I told him I was going to add this as a question, you know, for this episode, because I thought it just was, it was just so important, you know, for us to talk about this issue. And his question is, what are the sacrifices to their careers and their personal lives that are made by the spouses of people applying for the agent position and, and people who become agents? So he basically wants to know if your, your wife or your husband supports you and your role as an FBI agent, what do they go through? And I think it's an excellent question and so thoughtful. It, it is very thoughtful. And um, it's something that I probably don't hear from enough applicants because it is going to have an impact, not just on you, but on your family. Because remember I said, it's, it's not a career, it's a calling. Well, it's not just a calling. It's also a lifestyle. And that lifestyle is going to affect everybody that's in your life, not just you. So like any job that requires a loved one to be on call or away for an extended period to Quantico and beyond, Uh, It's often up to the spouse or significant other to cover the home front. So we actually have in Philadelphia, we have spouses and significant others come in with our candidates before they go to Quantico. So I have them come into our SAC conference room and I sit down with them and talk to them about the resources that they will have available. And I also encourage them to network amongst themselves. Because this really is the beginning for them of joining the FBI family. And the FBI is a very big family. It's not just made up of FBI employees. It's amazing the friendships and the networks that spring up between employees and their family members. And I have seen this in every office I've been in. So Philadelphia is office number three for me, and I have seen this consistently. We are really close knit, and families come together, particularly when anybody needs anything, if it is a critical time in their lives. So just as an example, we have this fantastic program in Philadelphia 
where FBI employees provide support to the extended law enforcement family, not just people within the FBI. And it doesn't even have to be a, a person that represents law enforcement. It's just someone that comes to our attention through our extended law enforcement family, that if they have a loved one that's being cared for at CHOP, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we have this program that we will make homemade meals for the family members who are with the sick children at CHOP. We have play dates for their siblings. We try to take them to the Jersey Shore or to museums to try, try to get their minds off of what's going on during this very stressful time. And I think that is just so indicative of the type of organization that the FBI is and a recognition of the impact that our family and the well-being of our family has on us as an organization. So we recognize completely the tremendous sacrifices that people have made for their spouses and their significant others to be a part of this organization. And I think it also is a recognition on their part that they say the work that you're doing in the FBI is so important and is so critical that I am willing to share my husband, my wife, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my partner in this way so that there might be a weekend that you have to cancel a vacation because something important happens or you might have to wait to have dinner because somebody can't get home at six o'clock at night. And we so fully appreciate the family members who pick up that slack when we have to be at work and when we have to be on duty. And in, in my family, there's two of us. So sometimes it's truly extended family members that provide us support. My in-laws in the Philadelphia area, the amazing caregiver that we have that uh, watches our children before and after school, it really is part of this enormous overall FBI family that encompasses everybody, not just the employees. So beautifully said. And I do want to stress that that continues way past your current role as an FBI agent. Even in the retired agent community, the Society of Former Special Agents of the FBI, which I'm an officer here in, in Philadelphia, we still have the spouses participate in our events. And I do want to stress that even for those that are single and you know, you're thinking about your workload and you can't get home to feed your dog, you know, it is such a family that you just give, you know, your one of your fellow agents your keys and say, you know, can you stop by my house and take my dog out? And 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 that kind of stuff is is done. It truly is a family, just like any other family that's with you for your entire lifetime. Absolutely. I I'm still in regular contact with people you know, that I, I knew back in 2001 <laughs> when, when I first came into the FBI. And I imagine I will know them for the rest of my days. And very short anecdotal uh, evidence of that, my recruiter is the godfather of my middle son. So you never know how long and how in-depth the relationship will be for the people that you meet even before your FBI career begins, um, because he obviously had quite an impact in my life. I would not have met my husband, would not have had my children if it were not for him bringing me into the FBI. So he is now the godfather of one of my children. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that really does illustrate uh, the, the connection. Well, that was our last official question, but I do have a question for you. Sure. And that question is, when did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? <laughs> so um, I joined the FBI in March of 2001. So it was six months before 9-11 hit. So I had an opportunity to see the FBI both before and after that event because we became a very different organization after 9-11. So I, I wanted to be an FBI agent when I was nine. Um, my parents have no idea where I came from. They are both artists. They taught art. When I went away to Quantico, they gave me a black sheep stuffed animal that sits on my desk to this day because they have no idea where I came from. But I know that what drove me to go into the FBI is I wanted to have an impact on the world in a positive way and to make sure that my 
short time on this planet was spent contributing to something greater. I really wanted to work crimes against children when I came into the FBI, and I was very lucky. I was blessed enough to do that early in my career before I moved on to counterterrorism. And I spent a good chunk of my career working counterterrorism, first in the LA field office and then in Baltimore. And then when I moved to Philadelphia, I was assigned to a cyber squad and became the coordinator for the uh, Philadelphia chapter of InfraGuard, which is our primary public-private partnership with representatives of critical infrastructure. And uh, I remain in that role to this day. But when the position came available, when Greg retired to become the office recruiter, it was a logical step for me because I believe very strongly in bringing in the next generation to hopefully reflect the excellence that I was lucky enough to be a part of for the past 18 years. I've been in this recruiting role since June, and I absolutely love it. I've loved every part of my FBI experience, and this is just one more chapter to add to it. And as I said earlier, I can't believe it's been 18 years. Well, Special Agent Serena Coughlin, I would like to give you the very, very last word. So if somebody is on the fence about applying for the Special Agent position, what would you tell them? Why are you on the fence? (laughs) If you are eligible to apply to become an FBI agent or a member of the FBI family in the professional support role, there's no reason really for you to wait. The FBI is so different from what people think. If your only exposure is what you see in movies or on the news, I would highly encourage everybody to continue to do their own research, starting with this podcast and then continuing on with fbijobs.gov. You need to contact your local recruiter with questions. So go to the website first, go to fbijobs.gov, develop specific questions that you have. So when you speak to your recruiter, you already have a lot of this basic information in place. And we're working to add a page to our local website that will notify Philadelphia area residents of recruitment events as they're coming up. So you can follow us on Twitter, our local Twitter account that's available on our Philadelphia webpage, and you'll get updates about what's taking place in our area. And you can get notified when something is coming up. And I would strongly encourage you to come out, interact with people in the FBI to get a better idea of what we're really all about, because it is an amazing organization because of the quality and caliber of its people. And we can't be an effective group without recruiting the most experienced and diverse workforce. So I encourage everybody, do the research and see how you can contribute. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Special Agent Serena Coughlin, links to fbijobs.gov. You'll find a listing of the FBI's core competencies, the FBI YouTube channel, and the video series on becoming an agent, plus a list of all of the questions covered in this episode. I hope you enjoyed the Q&A and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast on my website, I have a how to listen to a podcast blog post. Don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Thank you for listening to the very end. Soon you'll be able to pick up a copy of my nonfiction book, FBI and Film and Fiction, a manual for armchair detectives, coming soon to all stores where books are sold. If you want to support this podcast, I hope you also consider picking up copies of the crime novels in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.